Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's readings comes from Pathfinding on Plain and Prairie, originally published in 1898. John McDougall takes us through life in the Canadian Northwest in a time that is long past but not forgotten. My name is Teddy and I aim to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. Each episode is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. Thank you to UK Diane for your message through the website during the week. I'll aim to read some of your favourite chapters in an upcoming episode. Big thank you to listeners who are supporting through Anchor and Patreon. Your support continues to be greatly appreciated and allows me to keep bringing out more episodes. The podcast is completely free and it's the support from listeners that allows me to keep bringing out more episodes. If the podcast helps, please subscribe and leave a review. It really does help out. You can also say hello at boyyoutosleep.com. I'm also now on Twitter and Instagram at boyyoutosleep. In the meantime, lie back, relax and enjoy the readings. Pathfinding on Plain and Prairie Chapter 1 Thin Leather Homes Drudgery of the Indian women. Occupations of the men hunting parties and scalping forays. Triumphs of endurance. It was during the last days of January 1865 in the story of my experiences in our great Canadian West that I parted company for a time with my readers in saddle, sled and snowshoe. We were domiciled for the night in Muddy Bull's Lodge. The weather was intensely cold. I believe I am safe in saying that all through January the mercury never rose above 10 degrees below zero and it ranged from this down to 50 below zero. In our lodge, which was one of the best, with ordinary travelling costume on, a blanket or a robe over our shoulders, and a brisk fire in the centre of the tent, we were passably cosy, but even then, we had to turn around every little while and warm the other side. Great bright, brisk fires were kept up in those thin leather homes of our Indian people, entailing a vast amount of work upon the women and girls of the camps. Gradually, by example, perhaps more than precept, we brought about a lessening of the labour of the women. But in the meantime, during the cold winter months, the furnishing of wood to keep those huge fires going gave them constant employment. It must be said, however, They accepted the labour and drudgery with cheerful alacrity and could be seen at all hours of the day stringing over the hills and across the plains with dogs and horses 
their own backs loaded to the utmost carrying capacity with wood. The life of an Indian woman in those early days was indeed an extremely busy one, packing and unpacking dogs and horses, making camps, providing wood, making and mending moccasins and wearing apparel, cooking, cutting up, drying and pounding meat, rendering grease, chopping bones to get out the marrow fat, making pemmican, stretching, scraping and dressing buffalo hides to make robes or leather, a long, tedious process in which not only the brains of the worker were needed in order to excel, but also those of the dead animals as well, kept her going early and late. Besides all this, the manufacturing of saddles, tents and shaganapi also devolved upon the women, and yet notwithstanding all this, they seemed, generally speaking, to be contented and happy, and with true feminine resource still found time to give to attire and adornment, and the practising of all those mysterious arts which have charmed and magnetised the other sex, doubtless through all the past of our race. No wonder these women and girls were at a premium, and cost all the way from a blanket up to a band of stolen horses. The more of them there were, the greater the town was. Nor was the life of the male Indian altogether that of a sinecure. Somehow or other, the idea has gone abroad that these Indians led a very lazy life. But if the men who thought this had spent some time with either wood or plain Indians and had accompanied them on their hunting and war expeditions, he would have materially changed his views. To follow a wood hunter on foot from before daylight in the short days, through brush and copse and heavy timber, over big hills and across wide valleys, on and on for many miles, sometimes until noon or late in the afternoon before a kill is made, or having started game to run for miles at a terrific pace, hoping to head off the quarry and at last secure a shot, then having killed to butcher or secure from wolf or coyote or wolverine the desired meat and strike as straight as possible for the camp, sometimes many, many miles distant, with thick forest and dense darkness now intervening. Or it may be to have all the labour and exhaustion of such a chase without the chance of a shot, reaching camp late at night, wearied and disappointed, to continue this for days, sometimes feasting and again famishing, and all this not from choice but of necessity, could be counted no easy matter. It is not for fun but life, health, income, influence, honour, respect. All these are dependent on your efforts. It may be with the same wood hunter, you start a prime buck, moose or elk during those glorious days in the beginning of autumn, 
and he bounds away in his strength and swiftness. Your Indian says we must run him down, and leads off in long, regular strides, and for a time you feel as if your lungs were in your throat and your heart is beating a double tattoo over and under fallen timber, down precipitous banks, up steep hills, and it takes some time for you to catch your second wind and to brace up your will and say to yourself, I am also a man, and then settle down like your Indian to steady work. He, however, is doing more than you, who are but following him. He is noting lay of land and direction of wind, calculating in order to cut across where your game may have gone around, watching the tracks, gauging the distance the buck is ahead of you, noting the settling of the earth at edge of pool or creek where the big fellow left his tracks as he ran, and you are encouraged and spurred on, or contrary wise, as the crafty hunter tells you in hushed tones what he knows. Then by and by, after an hour or two, or three perhaps, of such work you stand beside the fallen carcass, and wipe your forehead and wish you had a dozen towels, But while your exaltations and congratulations are hot within you, a word of caution comes from the Indian beside you. The sun is low and the camp is far. Let us hurry. With a heavy load on your back, you start for the distant camp. Suppose as you tramped and climbed and panted, someone had said, What a lazy life yours is. You would have shouted back, No, sir, not in any sense is this a lazy life. Or it may be your hunter friend is in for a fur hunt, and you start with him to make a line of dead falls for Martin, or to hang a hundred or so of snares for lynx. The snow is deep, and at every step several pounds of it fall in on your snowshoe, but from early morning until late in the evening you tramp and toil, chopping and stooping and grunting over snare and dead fall. And when night is on, having carried your provisions, blanket and kettle all day, besides the baits for dead falls and snares for lynx traps, you dig away the deep snow cut some wood and make a fire for the night. While the fire burns, you doze and chill, and pile on fuel and wait for morning, only to repeat yesterday's work and so on, until, having made a big detour, and hung your snares and carefully fixed your dead falls, You in three or four days reach home. Then in a short time, you must visit all these and in the intervening days make your forays for food. No one who has tried this manner of obtaining a living will pronounce it a lazy life. But suppose you were with some plain or buffalo Indians, and as was about the average condition in the winter time, 
the buffalo were from 50 to 200 miles from your camp. The rigor of the winter and the condition of grass and wood forbidding the camp, moving any nearer to them. The hunting parties had constantly to be organized, and the meat and robes brought from long distances home. Under such circumstances, the hunter not only had to undergo great hardships, but also to run very great risks. Storms on the bleak, treeless plains, with a deep snow and travel of necessity slow and difficult, were indeed as the powers of the air, and darkness to encounter and overcome. And the really indolent man who was not in it when such work was engaged in, then it was incumbent upon every able-bodied man under the code of honour of the time, to make an annual or biannual or even more frequent foray for horses and scalps. These trips generally took place in the spring and fall, with the melting of snow and ice in spring, or the making of the same in autumn, Parties large and small would be made up, each with lariat and a few pairs of moccasins, and if possessed a gun, with as much ammunition as he could obtain, or armed with bow and quiver full of shod arrows, in the dead of night these men would start for the enemy's country, depending on sustaining life by the chase on their way. Journeying on, sometimes by day and sometimes by night, fording rapid streams and swimming wide rivers, what signified the breaking up of the season, or the plunge into ice-cold water of river and swamp to them, these must be considered as trifles. By and by, when the enemy's presence is felt, there will come the weary watching and waiting, amid cold and hunger, for cunning and strategy are now pitted the one against the other, and endurance and pluck must back these up or the trip will be all failure. One, two, three hundreds of miles and steady tramping, with your camp always facing in the direction of where your enemy is supposed to be. Every day or night the scouts, making thrice the distance covered by the party, keep up their constant effort to discover and forestall counter-war parties, or to find the enemy's camp and, when this is found, sometimes to hang for days on its movements, and, following up, watch for a favourable spot and time, either to make a charge or to steal in under cover of storm or darkness and drive off bands of horses. Then in either case to start for home and push on regardless of weather so long as men and horses will hold out. After a successful raid, those long runs for home were great tests of horse flesh and human endurance. With scalded legs, blistered feet and weary limbs, and with eyes heavy for want of sleep, these men, now exultant with victory, would vie with each other in the race for camp. 
A lazy man assuredly had no place in such trials of endurance and of hardship. Furthermore, upon the men and boys of the camp devolved the care of the horses. The herding and guarding of these gave many a weary tramp or ride, and many a night in cold and storm, without sleep or rest. And finally, the constant need of protecting their camps from the wily enemy was a source of permanent worry and always rested as a heavy responsibility upon these men. Chapter 2 Camping in the Snow Our Costume Brilliant sunrise effects. Maple and her pups found at last. Striking example of dog scents. The Fort Garry Packet. Just now, we are surrounded by both wood and plain hunters. Mask a platoon in my time always had a following of both parties. The gambling and conjuring drums are beating in several lodges. In others, as in ours, the evening hymn is being sung and prayer offered, and presently we roll in our blankets and robes, and sleep though it takes me some time to forget my lost train of maple and her pups. By 2 a.m., we are up boiling our kettle and snatching a bite of breakfast. Then, by the clear moonlight, we begin the loading of our sleds. This is tedious work, and had it not been for the innumerable host of dogs, our own to boot, we would have had this over and all ready last evening. Now in the keen cold of early morn, even old Joseph has to move quickly to keep from freezing. To put from five to six hundred pounds of frozen meat on a narrow dog sled, and as nearly as possible to maintain the equilibrium is no light task. But by four o'clock, sleds are loaded and dogs harnessed. We bid Mr. and Mrs. Muddy Bull a hasty goodbye and are off to make the 60-mile drive home in the day if we can. And who doubts our doing it? Not ourselves, at any rate. For the road is fair, our dogs fresh and strong, and we, costumed as we are, must move or freeze. Perhaps I am the best clad in the party, and my clothes altogether will not weigh much. A flannel shirt, moleskin pants, full-length leggings with garters below the knees, duffel socks and neat moccasins, a Hudson's Bay capote, unlined and unpadded in any part, a light cap and mittens which are most of the time tied on the load, while I wear a pair of thin unlined buckskin gloves, this in a sense almost laying aside every weight, but the race which was set before the ordinary dog driver in the days I am writing of was generally sufficient to keep him warm. In my own case, I did not for several years wear any underclothing, and though in the buffalo country and a buffalo hunter, I never had room or transport for a buffalo coat until the Canadian Pacific Railroad reached Alberta, 
and the era of heavy clothing and ponderous boots came in. With ever and anon men frozen to death in them. Not so with us, we run and lift and pull and push, and are warm. Old Joseph has for a leader a big dog called Blutcher, and every little while there rings out in the crisp air the call Butchin, for in Joseph's soft, unanimous tongue there is no use for the word and the letters L and R. Before daylight we have pulled up in the lee of a clump of poplars and kicking away the snow and gathering wood, have built a glorious fire, a hasty second breakfast, and again we are off, while the day sky is still faint in the eastern horizon, and now the cold seems to double in rigour. Old Draffin's breath solidifies here, it disappears into the infinity of frozen air on every hand. Even the smooth toboggan and the soft moccasin are not noiseless on the hard, crisp snow of the road. It is cold, but the colder it becomes, the harder we drive. Mars Butchin from Old Joseph, Yoho Putio from Sousa. The old dog inclined to sneak in my train is Grog. I ring out his name so sharply as to make him think his last day has come, and he springs into his collar with such vim as to quicken the whole train into a faster step. Now the morning is upon us, and presently the clear sunlight glorifies the waking world. Tiny shrub, willow bush, timber clump, valley and hill, with their millions of glittering ice crystals are brilliantly illuminated. The scene is dazzling and beautiful in the extreme. For miles on every hand, as we run the shadows, give way to the most brilliant light. And here and yonder the dark spots, denoting buffalo, singly or in groups, stand out with startling distinctness on the great white expanse. Stopping for our midday meal, we jerk our dogs out of their collars to give them a chance to lick snow and gambol around, and freshen themselves generally, while we hurriedly boil our kettle and get out our supply of dried meat. While doing this, we also give our dogs about two ounces each of the dried meat, just to liven them up and give them an agreeable anticipation of their supper. The one square meal in 24 hours they will have at the end of the day's journey. As we gnaw at our dried meat, Thankful that what teeth we have left are sound, we drink hot tea and discuss dogs, Indians, white men and the broad questions of civilization and Christianity. Sousa is thoroughly optimistic and joyously sanguine. Joseph is also as to Christianity but civilization and men and dogs, well, he kind of doubts. At any rate, he will wait and see. But we cannot wait till long now, 
so we tie on our kettle and cups, catch our dogs and start away, leaving our campfire to burn itself out as the shades of night are commencing to fall. We turn our loads on their sides and thus run them down the steep long banks of the Saskatchewan, then riding them at its foot, dash across the big river and with dogs pulling for all they are worth, we are pushing behind and then we climb the other more moderate bank and we are at home once more. There is general lamentation over the loss of Maple and her pups. The girls shed tears. Little George cannot understand how Big Brother John could lose a whole train of dogs and sled. Father had taken a great fancy to those pups ever since the Blackfoot trip, and he is sorry because of their loss. Never mind, we are at home, and we unharness and unload, pile away our meat and feed our dogs, visit with our friends, and long before daylight next morning, are out on the outbound journey for more meat. Reaching the Indian camp that evening, I was disappointed at there being no tidings of my lost train. But again we loaded and started home in the night. And before daylight we came to the camp of a solitary hunter, John Whitford by name, where to my great delight we found the missing team. They had come to John's camp a few hours before us. John said that he heard a jingle of bells and expected some travellers were either coming to or passing his camp. Then, hearing no further sounds, he went out to see what it was. When he found Maple alone in harness, but dragging the other four sets of harness behind her. Evidently, the sled had caught in some bush and the young dogs had become impatient, and one by one wriggled out of their bonds. Then the wise old mother dog had gone back, back to the sled and bitten off the traces close up to it, thus freeing herself from the sleigh and saving the harness. She then started for home, and concluding to the rest by the way at John's camp, we found her there with her pups. One often hears about horse sense, but here was a good large sample of dog sense that this dog, with her own traces and those of four other dogs between her and the sleigh, should pass all these and go back to the sleigh to cut away and liberate herself, and thus save to us these harnesses, was amazing. I would have rejoiced over the dogs alone, but to receive these back with the harness was great good fortune. I hitched Maple and her pups beside my own train, and taking some meat from Joseph and Sousa, lightened their loads and on we went at a much quicker step. On reaching home that evening, I need not say there was general rejoicing over the recovery of our dogs. As the buffalo moved, so did also the Indian camps, and gradually our meat trails went westward for the month of February. Through storm and cold and sometimes very heavy roads, 
or no roads at all. Joseph, Sousa and myself kept at the work of providing for our mission party. Those at home in the meantime were constantly busy holding meetings, doctoring the sick, taking out timber, whipsawing lumber and hauling hay or wood. Indeed, there was no time to become lonely or to think of the onions and garlic of the former Egypt. Our party knew it was out in a larger wilderness, but full of Christian resolution. Each one felt as did Doshua and Caleb. The event of the winter was the arrival of the February packet from Fort Garry. A few letters from eastern friends it might bring, with two or three newspapers several months old. But this was the one connecting link and the dwellers in the Hudson's Bay posts and at mission stations in the northwest, though far apart, felt a common interest in the packet for it not only brought news from the Far East, but also from one another. For days before its expected arrival at the post or mission, the packet was the chief item of conversation. Many an eye was turned to the direction whence it should come. Many a person the last thing at night would stand out in the cold and listen for the sound of bells, which might indicate the approach of the eagerly looked-for mail. And when at last it came, how many were disappointed. The one lone chance and still no news where so much had been expected and for the swarthy-faced, wiry-built, hardy men who brought this packet, as you looked at them, you could see fifty miles a day stamped on their every move, fifty miles and more through deep snow, blinding storms and piercing cold. Picked men these were, and they knew it, and held themselves accordingly, Heroes for the time being at every post they touched. Nor did these faithful fellows tarry long at any one place. Arriving in the morning, they were away the same afternoon. Coming in late at night, off before daylight next morning. This was the manner of their faithful service to the great company which somehow or other had the faculty of inspiring its employees with splendid loyalty to itself. And that concludes tonight's readings. I hope you're feeling drowsy and ready for sleep. You're always welcome to listen to another episode in the meantime. I'm going to be working on a new episode.